We're going to be dealing with uh, Italy from roughly 1870, and I hope we can make it all the way uh, to uh, at least 1922. This is really the first part of this discussion on how Italy becomes a fascist state, and then how that fascist state begins its move towards uh, aggressive actions in the 1930s. Uh, first things first, I'm the realist. I know, it just popped into my head. I'm, I'm a big, who's that person that does that? Yeah, but that's like 2000 late, right? Yeah, no, it's, it's old school. Yeah, I know, that's a long time ago. You guys were, oh, I, I don't know if you noticed the other day, um, you were called out by somebody in the YouTube world for your dabbing. Uh, they said, oh my gosh, yes. So, so if we ever do turn the camera around again, you've got you to gotta, you gotta shape up. Um, yeah, they, he, was, he was happy to see it wasn't just an epidemic. So anyway, um, Italy is a new country on the global scene in the 19th century. There is no Italy before 1861, all right? Italy before 1861 is just a collection, not even a collection. It's a bunch of separate principalities or smaller kingdoms, uh, regions that, that are, are living on their own and sovereign from their neighbors. So if you were from, like, Venice, you wouldn't say you're Italian. You would say you're Venetian. Uh, if you were from uh, Genoa, like Christopher Columbus and all that salami, you wouldn't say you're Italian. You would say you're Genoese. Um, or you'd probably say it in something that sounds a little more Italian. Um, so, so there is no united Italy. But these separate regions of Italy are going to recognize the writing on the wall in Europe in, in the 19th century. This segregated Italy has got an Austrian empire to its north. They've got a powerful French nation to its northwest. Um, hopping further north, um, you've got a German empire, or a German state uh, that is soon to be uniting with each other uh, and, and with Prussia. So if you, kinda, if you don't grow into a bigger nation state, you might find yourselves being dominated, militarily and otherwise, by the more powerful nations in Europe. So in 1861, we've got a unification of what becomes known as the Kingdom of Italy. Despite this unification, there is no national identity. Just because there is now a unified Kingdom of Italy doesn't mean Northerners and Southerners or people from various regions of now Italy get along with each other. So from its earliest days, it wasn't the most united of kingdoms uh, in, in Italy. We're going to today talk about a period in Italian history known as Liberal Italy, from 1870 to 1923. When I use the word liberal, I'm not using it in the modern connotation we have in our politics, right? Uh, a quick time out, do not write this. In the United States today, we, we talk of people being either liberals or conservatives in, in various gradations of that, right? Um, and, and what does that mean in the United States in 2017 to be a liberal? What, what kinds of ideas do, li do liberals espouse? Progressive. Okay, we, we already talked about this in this class. Yeah, progressive ideas. Give me a couple examples. What, what, what might a liberal be in support of? Okay, marriage equality, maybe more gun control, um, more programs for like a social safety net. Uh, uh, very good. Universal health care. Uh, the government maybe being a single health, uh, single payer health care option. Awesome. That's a, those are all liberal ideas. And then on the flip side, conservative ideas um, would be, well, the opposites of many of those. And maybe a less intrusive government into the realm of business and enterprise and, and whatnot. Uh, those are modern conventions, liberal and conservative. But these words have existed for, for a couple centuries now. In the 19th century, a conservative tended to be somebody that supported the traditional notion of a central monarch, all right? To hold on to like a one king rule of a nation. And that opposed a more liberal idea of people having a vote, citizens of a nation that have representation and they get to vote for that representation having individual rights that are protected by a rule of law. 
So when we say that kind of liberal, or like this liberal Italy from 1870 to 1923, Republicans today con that are conservative and Democrats that would say they're liberal, they're all liberals, right? This is what we would call a classical liberalism. They all fit into that, that idea of individual rights, although they might differ sometimes on which rights to emphasize, but they all support ideas of individual rights. They all support ideas of people having a vote for our representation. So they're all liberals today. Italy, while they were in this liberal Italian period, was a democratic monarchy, a constitutional democratic monarchy. A constitutional monarchy, recall, is they, they've got a king. And for our class, we're going to be concerned about one king during World War I named Victor Emmanuel III. Victor Emmanuel III. He's the king of Italy. The last king of Italy, really. You guys are very excited about that. All right. Uh, Victor Emmanuel III. So they've got a king, but it's a constitutional monarchy. They have a constitution. All a constitution is, is a written set of laws, uh, a rule of law for your country. So our constitution is just like we just called it a constitution because it's literally what it is. Um, and it lays out the operation, the basic operation of our government. That's what a constitution is. This is a big change from traditional governments in, in Europe. If there was a king without a constitution, the king could wake up one morning, stretch his arms, and change the rules for the state. He could do it on a whim. But when you are bound to a constitution that maybe can only be changed by your representative bodies, maybe in conjunction with the king, but you need them along with you, then you, you can't do quite as much. All right? So this is a constitutional monarchy. Citizens choose their leaders. There are free and open elections. When I say a free election, just because you have an election doesn't mean it's a legitimate liberal democracy. They might not be free. You might not be free to choose who you want to vote for. Like if you ever see guys running in elections and they, they are excited and they're printing in their own government-run newspapers that 100% of the people voted for them, it's not a free election. People didn't have a free choice. If I were to give you all a vote on whether or not you want me to bring donuts to our next class, there would probably be somebody that would be like, no, donuts are really unhealthy, and I don't think we should be ending our day with that. Um, and and we, we couldn't even get someone to agree with something like that, right? Um, so anyway, also in this liberal Italy, individual rights are protected by Italian law. But that doesn't mean that everything is peas and carrots or, I don't know, pistachios and, and, and I don't know, I'm thinking, I can't even think of a, a, a distinctly Italian vegetable. What is it? Tomatoes. But it's not, it's American. What's, rapini, okay, whatever. I don't know, I don't care. Um, it doesn't mean everything is perfect in this liberal Italy. Because you guys understand. Hey, 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 wrap it up here. When you have, like, people with some say in how their government is run, we often voice opinions that differ from each other. We, we certainly see this in our country. This past weekend, we had a pretty big, out-of-nowhere political controversy erupt in the United States, right? And, and there are distinct sides in this, and there are Americans that are kind of at each other's throats about whether we should accept someone that kneels during the national anthem or, or not, right? Um, so when you have people with free choice able to freely exercise their rights to decide how a country moves forward, you will have disagreements. And Italy is no different. You got a lot of things going on in this new, relatively new Italian state. Lots of differences between people that live in the north of Italy and people that live in the more agricultural south of Italy. You've got a wealth disparity, a serious wealth disparity in Italy between the wealthy landowners of Italy and the poorer Italians, in some cases, uh, who are merely tenant farmers. You have an underrepresented uh, working class in Italy. The workers of Italy, the laborers of Italy, in the earliest days of the Italian democracy, don't have a vote. Remember how when we started off, too, we only allowed the vote to go towards, like, the landowners? 
And what, what is that connection between between only letting landowners vote? Where does this idea come from? Why why just landowners? Yes. Maybe they're more educated. Maybe they'll be more likely to make a good decision. Yep, what else do landowners do? And, and in fact, what uh, what did landowners do that many other Americans never did? Uh, Miss Woodcox, they were the ones that pay the taxes, right? Before 1916 in the United States, it was unconstitutional to charge an income tax. Today, any American that works legally pays taxes, right? Uh, and it's just taken right out of our paychecks. That was illegal before 1916. Constitution changed and the government allowed it. Before that point, the only taxpayers in the United States were landowners. And the landowners, of course, thought, well, hey, if we're the ones paying for this government, we should be the only ones making decisions for how this government operates. Kind of only seems fair, right? Like, if you're paying into it, you should be the one to decide. Of course, this idea has changed over time. And then we started taxing all Americans that, that work. So the, the vote began to expand in the United States. And we would see the same take place in other young democracies around the world. Even so, there are many Italians that feel disenfranchised, that don't feel a part of the Italian political system. In 1914, right on the cusp of the First World War, this would erupt in Italy in a, in a general strike where laborers of many industries go on strike to protest their working conditions. This causes a lot of political rift in, in, in Italy and some politicians even call for the banning of labor unions and the banning of a young socialist party in Italy, a socialist party that, that's, that's just growing to try to put down these kinds of, of demands. Yes? Okay, two questions. Yeah. When you said, um, the, for the strike, what year was that? 1914. In the original Italian democracy, only landowners could vote, and then the vote would be slowly expanded. But still, the poorest in Italy um, had the least amount of political power in Italy. So at least there were repression of... Yes. Uh, Okay. Yeah, frustration and, 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 and repression, I guess we could say. Um, we also in Italy have a, a powerful nationalist movement growing. It's the same thing we saw in Japan, and it's the same thing we see in other European countries. Nationalism is, remember, one of the causes of the First World War, right? This idea that your nation should be strong, your nation should expand its borders, uh, your citizens should be proud of their nation, your nation maybe should benefit at the expense of your neighbors. This existed in Italy as well. Italy by the 20th century had begun to create a, a small empire, largely in Africa. Largely in Africa. In 1885, the Italians got their first overseas colony in a place that is known as Eritrea. I'm going to pick this up, and it is right there. Uh, there is Eritrea. Some say Eritrea. I kind of like Eritrea better. I'm not sure which is the appropriate way to say it. But I say Eritrea. A uh, little, tiny, uh, little tiny country in uh, northeast Africa. In 1889, the Italians would expand from there into what is known as Italian Somaliland. Italian Somaliland. 1889. You don't have to memorize these years at all. Just know that Italy is getting into the empire building game. But they're getting into the empire building game a little later than some of their neighbors. In 1885, the Italians accept, uh, attempted to conquer a much larger tract of land called Ethiopia, or Abyssinia at the time. Abyssinia or Ethiopia, same difference. And they were defeated. Foreshadowing to a later discussion. 1880, or 1895, the Italians were defeated in an attempt to conquer Ethiopia or Abyssinia. This is going to be a black eye in the, uh, the prestige that many Italians will feel about their nation. Because this is a white European nation going into Africa and being defeated by an African independent nation. This is a blow to their psyche, right? 
they'll, they'll try to redo this in the 1930s. In 1912, the Italians will fight a brief war against the now failing Ottoman Empire. And out of that war, Italy will take over Libya. So Italy is growing an empire. Italy is growing an empire. But their empire is still small compared to that of the British, certainly, or the French, or even the new German nation. And then comes the Second World War. Strike that. Then comes, we'll edit that in post-production, then comes the First World War, right? The First World War, thank you. Feel free to correct me when I say stupid things. Then comes the First World War. Now, I don't like this map, but I use this map because of sheer laziness. It's the first one I found that kind of showed what I was looking for. Prior to 1940, the only thing I don't like is, uh, I guess it's okay. I, I don't like how they call this military alliance in 1914 the Central Powers, because it really didn't get that name until after the war begins. Anywho, before 1914, before World War I began, Italy would join an alliance with Austria-Hungary and Germany. This alliance became known as the Triple Alliance. Originally, it was the Dual Alliance, just Austria-Hungary and Germany, because they like both spoke German. Italy hops in on that. And they hop in on that because they see that France and Russia had formed their own alliance called the Dual Entente, which was not really focused on Austria or Italy. It was focused on more on Germany. Well, Italy is looking up at France. Notice they share a border with each other. And Italy would say, hey, if a beef ever comes with these guys, maybe we can chip away some land from France. It would be good for Italy. This was a military defensive alliance. What that means is the only compulsion to fight is if anybody in this alliance is attacked by someone else. So if France fight, uh, attacks Germany, then Germany, Italy, and Austria would be in a war against France. If Russia attacks Austria, the three of them would be in a war against Russia. But you guys recall from last year, how does World War I actually begin? Who attacks whom? The Serbs. No, Germany attacks France. First. Okay. The first, actually, Austria attacks Serbia. Now, yes, Franz Ferdinand was assassinated by a Serb terrorist, but that wasn't in and of itself an act of war, and it wasn't conclusive at the time whether the Serb government called for it to happen or not. Austria attacks Serbia. Italy is not compelled to defend that. It was Austrian aggression. And then shortly after, Germany mobilizes its army and invades France through neutral Belgium. Again, this is a German aggression, active aggression. Italy is not compelled to join that. So despite the war beginning in, in August of 1914, Italy stays out. August, September, October, November, December, January, February, March, Italy is still not in this war. At that point, by April of 1915, with a lot of pressure being put on the king and the government of Italy to join the war, not on the alliance side, the triple alliance side, but to join the war on the Entente side. Because by this point in 1915, you've got the United Kingdom, biggest empire in the world, France, stalemating with Germany in uh, the northeast of France, Russia, Certainly being pushed back, but giving Austria-Hungary some fits, all right? At this point, the Italians are going to make a decision to join the war on the Entente side. Entente is a French word that means agreement, and all it means is, just remember that France is in that, that uh, alliance. So Italy, when they actually join World War I, they will leave the former alliance that they were a part of and hop on and become one of the Entente powers. The hope from Italy is the same thing that they had hoped from their original alliance. That should they win a war, they might be able to gain some territory from Austria-Hungary. Right? If Austria-Hungary is defeated, they would be able to uh, gain Austrian territory. That's the goal. During this war, there is, of course, still political division in Italy. That socialist party that had been growing in Italy doesn't want to see Italy jump into World War I. They see World War I the way socialists see war, as imperialist wars, only meant to bring wealth to the wealthy. One member of the Socialist Party in Italy 
was this man, Benito Mussolini. Look at, he's going to look, every picture you're going to see of Benito Mussolini, he's going to be looking like shady at you, okay? Like, you're up there, like, like, we just walked in and caught Benito Mussolini doing something he didn't want to be caught doing. I don't know what it was. But anyhow, Benito Mussolini is a member, a prominent member of the Italian Socialist Party. He actually uh, writes the socialist newspaper. But as the war proceeds, as Italy joins the war, and as the war seems to be going well for the Entente powers, Benito Mussolini starts to shift his tune and be more supportive of Italy being in the war, with hopes that they can gain some land out of it. For this, Benito Mussolini will be ousted from the Socialist Party. And that will leave him in a position to create his own political movement, which we'll talk about in a moment here. Now, I want to spend a couple seconds talking about Italy and the First World War, because I think it's often forgotten uh, that Italy even fought in World War I. When we think of World War I, we think of the Western Front, certainly. We might think of the Germans and the Russians fighting in the East. We might think of uh, the, the stories about the Battle of Gallipoli, for example, when the British fought the Ottoman Empire um, in present-day Turkey, right? But rarely do we think about the Italian front. And, and in World War I, during, uh, in World War I, during this uh, Italian fight, you've got the nation of Italy fighting the Austro-Hungarian Empire in their north. This was every bit as brutal and as violent as the war in the Western Front. And it was very similar to the war in the Western Front in that it was a stagnant war, an entrenched war. Neither Austria-Hungary nor the Italians gained any ground on, on either one. Throughout the three years that they would be fighting each other, through the three years that they would be fighting each other, the line would only move a few miles. But despite this lack of movement in the war, the Italians would lose over a million guys. This was horribly devastating for the Italian nation during the war. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So you you've got but but rugged trench warfare fought in a, a rugged terrain, unlike the the relatively flat lands of, of Belgium and France. So this is a horribly brutal war that the Italians are, are fighting, and the war will further divide the Italian people and the Italian political system. So the point of World War I and how ugly it is for Italy is it's taking an already fragile and fledgling democracy and making it even more fragile. And as it becomes more weak, it makes it easy for a new political idea to take hold. And that new political idea will be Benito Mussolini's fascist party. Um, this is a symbol for the National Fascist Party of Italy. I will talk for a moment about this word fascism because it is maybe overused today in, in 2017. Today, a fascist tends to be anyone you don't agree with. Uh, there are people on the far right that call people on the far left fascists, and there are people on the far left that call people on the far right fascists. Uh, so it's kind of become, become one of these things that if everybody is a fascist, fascism really loses its meaning, all right? The original fascists were a political party. Now, note, please note, that today the word fascist has very much a negative connotation, right? You, you wouldn't want to be called a fascist. Right? No. Some people, I think, want to be called fascists. Uh, if, if you're cool with the... Okay, let's leave it at this. I'm, I'm making this up as I talk right now. If you're okay with being called a fascist, you're probably an actual fascist. All right? If you take offense when someone calls you a fascist, you might not be a fascist. You could still be, but you might not be. Uh, same, same is true for the Nazis. Remember, the Nazi, of course, is a, a bad word. Like, nobody today wants to be called a Nazi unless you are a Nazi. And then you're totally okay with it. But just like the, the word Nazi was just an, an abbreviation for National Socialism in, in Germany, it was, a, it was a political party in Germany, the word fascist was merely a political party in Italy. It just so happened that the Nazis and the fascists shared similar ideologies. So the Nazi party really was 
ideologically a fascist party in Germany. They just didn't call themselves fascists. They called themselves national socialists. So let's talk about what fascism is. First of all, the, the, the word fascist has in its origin this thing from ancient Rome. This is known as a fasces. It's a bundle of sticks tied together, bound together, you see, with an axe head in it. And the idea of the fasces is it is far stronger. Like if I were to take a, one stick out of that bundle and whack Brandon with it, he'd be like, ow, that would hurt. It wouldn't feel good. And if I hit him hard enough, I'd probably break the stick long before I would break Brandon. But if I were to bundle all these sticks together and even put an axe head in it and whack Brandon with that, he wouldn't be like, ow, Doby, stop. He would be like, oh, why? Right? And, and, and that would be it for him. Because standing together, standing together, they're far stronger. So this became a symbol. It, this was literally a tool used in ancient Rome. But through centuries, it became a symbol that those that stand together are going to be far stronger than those that stand on their own. All right? This is a symbol that you see pop up in many places. You guys ready to have your minds blown? Yeah. All right, let's have your minds blown. There's Barack Obama giving a State of the Union address. Um, and here we have to the left of him. A fascist to the right of him, a fascist, because 50 states standing in union together with each other are far stronger than they would otherwise be. This predates Benito Mussolini's fascist party, absolutely. You ready to have your mind blown even more? Yes, please. Oh. Here's Abraham Lincoln at the Lincoln Memorial, and the arms... The arms of the chair that he is resting on, there's no axe, but it is still the bundle of sticks tied together. Huh? Well, the axe just turns it into a strong weapon. But this symbolizes, again, this is the fascists symbolizing those that stand together are far stronger. Wow, you guys are very excited about that. That's all I got right now. What was it used for in Rome? Huh? What was it used for in Rome? Chopping up other sticks and making more fascies, I would imagine. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Like, it's a weapon. It, it, it's, it's a weapon. So, that's where the, the origin of the word fascist comes from. Now, the party itself, the party itself, here's what they believe. I'm going to give you five ideas. Five ideas. First, a promotion of nationalism. Fascist states, whether they be Italy or Germany or eventually Spain, fascist states are fiercely nationalistic. Now, this doesn't mean if you're nationalistic, you're necessarily a fascist. But if you're fascist, you are a nationalist. You guys probably do that in like stats or something, right? Uh, there you go. So the, the nation uh, is a unifying force and it's superior to other nations, right? So this promotion of nationalism. Fascist states also call for the removal of any foreign influences. They want to be totally sovereign and independent and have outsiders out. Yeah. Build a wall and keep them out. Okay, relax, relax. <laughs> yeah, come on now. I know you are being facetious here. Uh, <laughs> But some, some have, right, well, and, and this, is, this is why, this is why, though, this word gets thrown around in modern politics. Like, there are some that would look at, at the, the Trump rallying cries of build a wall as, as a statement that might fit in line with this notion of keeping foreign influence out of the United States. So we still hear this word certainly thrown around today. Fascist states have strong leaders who are dictators in a one-party government. This is just all two. I'm on two. Promotion of, na promotion of nationalism. Okay, I'm going to slow down. I, I've got promotion of nationalism, and then I explained what that meant. Like, the state is a unifying force above all else, and removal of foreign influence. That's all nationalism. My bad. It doesn't matter. There's, I'm never going to have you, like, list these off. Just kind of understand them all collectively. So number two... A, a totalitarian state ruled by one leader, one dictator. 
in a one-party state. No more Republicans and Democrats debating each other and sharing power in a state. It's a one-party state. What was one of the flaws with Italy prior to Benito Mussolini taking over is they had multiple political factions competing for power and disagreeing with each other. Mussolini and the fascists would say, that weakens Italy. Three, war. A fascist believes that war revitalizes a society. That war is good. Yes? And he was a socialist, anti-war socialist? He was originally a socialist, but then started supporting the idea of World War I, and they booted him out of the party. So war is good for society. This is kind of weird, right? Because we spend already a lot of time about how most of the world feels, certainly most of Europe feels, after the, second world, or after the First World War, right? That war should be avoided at all costs. That's not what the fascists are about. Also, with the idea of building a militaristic war state, that an empire should be created. Fascist states support the idea of expanding their borders and creation of empires. And this all really feeds on itself, right? Because when you create an empire, how do your people start to feel about their country? Yeah. Yay! It, it, it raises the prestige of a nation, right? Yeah. To, to have an empire to look upon. Fascists are anti-communist. Fascists are anti-communist. Yes, this is four. Fascists are anti-communist. Now, this is kind of weird, because many of us associate socialism and communism together. And we already mentioned that Benito Mussolini started out as a socialist, so how does he then become an anti-communist? This gets created from the idea of the nationalism of the fascists. Communism in, 19, in the 19-teens, 1920s, was not about nationalism. It was about reaching beyond national borders. Communism wanted to create an international communist world where the communist world would work together beyond national borders. The fascists weren't about this. They were about nationalism. So going hand in hand with that, number five, fascists were anti-internationalist. Anti-internationalist. Recall when we talked about Japan in the 1920s. A, a Japan in the 1920s, like many European countries in the 1920s, tried to work together with the international community to avoid future conflicts. They failed, but we don't really know they're going to fail yet. They failed. A fascist would say, no, we're not internationalists. We are not going to work with the international community. We are on our own looking out for our own best interest because it is our state above all else. Yes. That means they are, um, I wouldn't say, is when I hear isolationist, I hear we're going to keep to ourselves and not interfere with what goes on in the world. The fascists certainly aren't isolationists because they want to create an empire. So they are reaching out. And when you move to create an empire, you might run into other adversaries around the world. They just don't want to necessarily work with others. We're going to hold it off there.